in 2007 i visited Woolwich, a small town on the banks of river thames in the london borough of greenwich which was a crucial part of my life since 1980. Woolwich was the first town that i had visited when i migrated to uk in 1980. it is where i worked as a met police officer from 1982 till 1987. I began my anti-racist career there and from 1990 I represented people of Woolwich as an elected council member till 1994. Woolwich was also my home since 1985 and I completed my first degree in sociology from University of Greenwich's Woolwich campus in 1991. During my 2007 visit to London, the second since I migrated to Australia in 1995, I caught up with my former anti-racist colleague and a dear friend. We had an opportunity to catch up and discuss our long and eventful anti-racist journey together that had started in 1987 when I had retired from the Met Police and joined the community struggle. Video footage remained unexplored until Wednesday, 22nd May 2013. The brutal murder of an innocent army officer, Lee Rigby, has deeply troubled me. It has prompted me to cut and upload this video interview of Dev Bara. The intention here is to provide a brief history of racism and anti-racism efforts of some people of Greenwich. Their efforts had made the area relatively safe since the days when Greenwich was dubbed as the racist capital of Europe. This brutal and senseless matter has once again brought attention to this little town close to my heart. Now let us watch what Dev has to say. Okay, my name is Dev Barra. I am uh, from Greenwich Action Committee against Social Attacks. It's uh, now called Racial Attacks Monitoring Unit. I've been working here since uh, 1980. It wasn't a funded organization, but uh, towards that, uh, uh, around 1987, there was a major problem in this borough. We had the uh, National Front and the British National Party, which were going to stand for election. This is the time that I met Satish in this uh, area, and uh, there were a number of very serious attacks. I remember uh, that year on the 1st of January, there were five people attacked very seriously. Uh, some young people were carrying Stanley knives and attacking people at random and there were five people attacked. And the time I arrived in Birmingham was the time when Enoch Powell made his famous speech, Rivers of Blood. And we had, uh, not very far away from where we were living, which was in Suffer Road, an uh, area called West Bromwich, where the Antipaki League was set up. Now, Antipaki League was a gang of skinheads who used to go around beating Asian kids. So me being 14, uh, we started the Asian Youth Movement. I was the secretary of the Asian Youth Movement. and We were based in Villa Road in Birmingham. And the idea was to make sure this National Front, the Panty Packy League, does not come into our areas and attack our people. So my uh, involvement with this anti-racist movement has been since that day, which is like 1969. And I came to London in 1980. Uh, there was a group called Greenwich Action Committee Against Racial Attacks. It was set up in 1978 in this borough. There was a murder of an Asian taxi driver. Because there was an inaction of the police here and the local authorities, the people felt strongly that there should be an organization which should challenge uh, the inaction of these two authorities. So when I came in 1980, Gakara by name existed, but there wasn't much work done. So what we done first was to go out, contact our communities, empower them to report the antisocial behavior, racial violence, and then ask for funding from the council. And we got funding in 1984. So we were volunteers from 1980 to 1984. Uh, when we did get the funding, uh, there was for three and a half workers. And uh, in those days in Greenwich we had, we didn't have the National Front or the British National Party here. What we used to have was uh, the British movement. And we used to have a guy called Alex Campbell 
they used to be very near Woolwich Shale, they used to go around causing problems, especially attacking shopkeepers and things like that. Yeah? So in those days, the British uh, movement also had a different name, which they used to call themselves Hitler Boys and Girls. In 1987, things went quite bad in this para. Uh, it was time when I met Satish Rai. It was time when the British National Party and the uh, National Front decided to stand for election in this borough. The literature was absolutely horrendous they produced. It was attacking black and Asian people, uh, was stuck on the bus stops and all that, was posted through our organizations, any, anyone, uh, any organization, voluntary sectors, black organizations had these leaflets through their doors, which incited racial hatred. There were a number of attacks made on the people. I remember very well on the 1st of January that year in 1987 that there were five young people who armed themselves with a crowbar and a knife, Stanley knife, and went on a rampage. And I remember one Asian guy got slashed across the face which he required 14 stitches for. And a, a black guy was hit across the face with a crowbar. I remember visiting him in the hospital that time and another three very serious incidents took place and that was all because of the publicity what the BNP and the National Front have produced and passed in this borough. So 87, when they stood for election, there were, uh, there were uh, about 400 people outside the BNP uh, hall where they were speaking and uh, I remember that uh, me and Satish had organized that that mobilization of people and we were asking the police that we actually wanted to go inside and hear what the BNP are going to offer to black and Asian people in the borough and the police were a bit scared wouldn't let us in but we pressurized them at that time and 17 of us were allowed inside the meeting and you can imagine what happened uh, as soon as we got in there and we were physically attacked and there was uh, at least 11 people which ended up in hospital but we did not stop there. We went to the National Fund meeting, which was held in a school nearby, and we disrupted that too. So this is 1987, and Satish will remember that in 1989, the British National Party opened the headquarters nearby at 154 Upper Wickham Lane. And how many pickets, uh, how many pickets of the Baxley Council? I think me and Satish was involved with at least 19 pickets of the council to remove the British National Party from those premises and I remember sometimes we've been dragged out of the meetings by the police that, that uh, you know we were disrupting the meetings but uh, that was 1989. In 1991 we had a gang called the Goldfish Gang which operated in an area called Thamesmead. They used to be into car crime and drugs everything but Greenwich Council record on employing black youth workers was very poor in those days and we pressurized the Greenwich Council that they should have a black youth, wo youth worker and the first one they employed was at Hawksmoor Youth Club which was in Thamesmead. Her name was Anne Brewster and because she went there, her son Zion Brewster went there, her friend Marlon Conton, his friend Jason Park, they all started going to the youth club and this goldfish can suddenly became the Nazi turnout. They started attacking the black people. So we had, in May that year, we had Zion Brewster stabbed. The same year, Jason Park got beat up. In November that year, we had the most serious attack on Marlon Conton. They put him in hospital, unconscious for three days. I was interviewed on the television after the Gulf War started in 1991. Charlton Mosque was set on fire, Plumstead Mosque was set on fire, Gurdwara in Mason Hill was set on fire. And I was interviewed on the television and I was saying, look, we know who the perpetrators are. We worked in this area. And if the police don't do anything, that there's going to be murder. And this was said on the 20th of February 1991. And the very next day, you remember that we had the first murder of Roland Adams and the papers carried a, a warnings saying the deadly prediction came true. So we knew it was going to happen. Yeah. So that was the first murder of Roland Adams. And 
How will police try to cover that up? Because in those days, it was best for the police not to say it was racially motivated. They would say it was a gang fight. And we were, our argument was, how can you have a gang fight with two people on one side and 15 people on the other side? How can that be a gang fight? And also that he was definitely abused, racially abused. He was called a nigger. Yeah? So I mean, those are the difficulties at that time. But we, as you remember, Satish, that uh, organized the pickets of the police station. We mobilized community. We had at least four marches in that area to try and change things. And in the end, the police said, OK, it was racially motivated. Then, you, uh, as you remember, that we had the second murder of Rohit Dugal. And with Rohit Dugal's murder, that he was a young Asian lad who was with white friends, three women and two males. They went to a kebab shop after a party to buy some chips. In the kebab shop, there were two guys playing the penny machines, yeah? The fruit machine, yeah? One guy was called Kenny Bay, the other one was Peter Thompson. As soon as they walked into the kebab shop, Ruhi's friend made a comment about the ponytail which uh, uh, Peter Thompson had, and Peter Thompson, because of that, started an argument with his friend. Rohit is the one who stopped the argument, but as soon as he walked out to the kebab shop, Kenny Bay said, get the packy, and they chased him and stabbed him, and he was killed right in front of the funeral parlor in Altamai Strait. And uh, uh, Satish, you remember us mobilizing for that, because the terrible shame in this case was that the mother was born with disability, which was that she could not hear and she cannot speak. And she, it was the only child she had. And she had brought him up on her own until uh, uh, when he was two years old, because the father left them. And she had great hope from that. He was going to grammar school. He was in Chisel Husk Grammar School. He was a good lad. And when he died, we wanted to lay a wreath where he had died. And I remember, and Satish, you will remember, that when we went to lay a wreath, we could hear in the background people singing Rule Britannia. I remember a police officer coming to us to say that you must turn the march back because waiting for you up the road are 200 skinheads. And we said that we have never turned an anti-racist march backwards, that we are going to go forward. And if you don't do something about it, we will. Because there are only 200 of them, we are 4,000 of us, yeah? So I remember laying a wreath and everything. That was the murder of Rohit Jugal. Then things didn't stop there. The very next year, 50 yards away from where uh, Rohit had died, we had the next murder of Stephen Lawrence. Now, the people who killed Stephen Lawrence were known to us. As you know, that we at, the, at Stephen Lawrence inquiry, we provided evidence that these same people had attacked a guy called Shah at 127 Landbrook Road. They also attacked a guy called Stacy Benfield. They also attacked a guy called Banger at the Wimpy Bar in Eltham. I remember us going there and asking the guy in the Wimpy Bar that we, you know, you know who the guy is and we should do something about it. And his answer was that he knows, but he doesn't want to do anything about it because his business will go down the drain. And he pointed out it was Norris. And we already knew it was Norris from other witnesses who have told us, yeah? So these kind of things was happening. And this guy, gang had already threatened, beaten up people, sprayed people in the eyes, and stabbed them, who killed Roland, uh, Stephen Lawrence, yeah? So this, this is kind of thing happened. Then straight after Stephen Lawrence's death, they set up a group called um, uh, EEDF, Eltham English Defense Force. What the first letter they sent out was to a nursery which uh, displayed a sign saying, welcome in all languages. They asked them to remove those, otherwise they will burn the nursery down. So you can imagine what happened to the parents. There were 80 children were withdrawn straight away. It took us six months to get them confident enough to go back when we provided some security for them, the cameras and all that. Also with volunteers, as you know, that you used to do all that kind of work with us, yeah? That we provided that kind of safety net for them so they could go there. The same gang again wrote a letter to a black woman who was going to move into, uh, into Middle Park saying, 
uh, drew a heart and knife that we don't want niggers in this bara. So she didn't move in there. So those kind of things happened. These are in the 90s, everything, when you were Satish uh, present in, uh, in the UK. Then since, uh, since 91, yeah, uh, we have had uh, another three murders, uh, overly, overly planned, where uh, when we approached the mother, Satish, you were with us then, that the mother didn't want to campaign around that, so we had to leave it at that. That was racially motivated. Then we've had another two murders, and we call them murders, police call them deaths in police custody. So we've had two guys, one guy called Koka, which died a couple of years ago here, and very recently another Nigerian guy died when the police went to arrest him. So we've had a number of murders, so in total we've had five murders in this borough, yeah, which are directly races yeah then uh, a couple of years ago uh, not a couple of years ago so you have to cut all this and i'll shut that all right uh, i'd like to update you satish you know, since you and you migrated from here since 95 uh, what has been going on in this bar yeah now abbeywood was a hot spot once again you know when you were here it used to be once again there was a problem in Abbeywood. we done some work uh, with the schools and everything, yeah? Uh, we found out that uh, uh, it was the uh, only way we're going to sort the problem out is to actually move into Abbeywood. So the Greenwich Council provided us with empty building like they used to in those days, yeah? So we found ourselves an empty flat in Ensham Drive. And from there, we went door knocking. So what we done was recruited people as we went along. So first person we recruited was the, the vicar from uh, William Temple Church called Marian Goddard. Goddard, she and the pastor Mac and the Catholic Church, Patrick, we all went door to door. And the idea was in those days when you were here, uh, the publicity we would produce would, would say on the top, racial attacks on the increase. And that what we found out now recently is that if you put racial attacks on the increase and distribute that kind of leaflets, you know, most of the white people are going to throw that in the bin because they'll say, oh, it's racist again, it's them lot again, that kind of stuff, yeah? Now, when we were working at Abbeywood, what we found out was the people who are taking drugs, people who are dr abusing alcohol, people who were mugging people, people who are just hanging around being antisocial were the same people who would spit on you if you were black or Asian. So the thing is, that, that was a connection we did not make before, that we are talking about a handful of people who are harassing hold of the community, yeah? So we had to design a literature that we are now looking at to solve the community problem because we are part of the community. It's not us and them no more. It is us lot. It's our community and we're going to do something about it. So the literature now would say anti-social behavior on the top and then it will list down things like domestic violence, racial violence, uh, car crime, drugs, uh, all different kind of anti-social behavior. So although we will, would just look at the racial part of it, we would deal with that, but we now were working in multi agents with other agencies that we could actually pass the cases on. So if it was domestic violence, we would pass that to the police. We got the community safety unit, the police will deal with that. If it was somebody who reported that there's been a car dumped out of their house, has been there a long time, then clean sweep is the people who will go and re remove the car. And graffiti, the same, we got a graffiti hotline. So we would photograph the graffiti first and then get it removed. So all these agencies came together. So every six weeks we would have a meeting with the head teachers because the majority of the perpetrators of racist, racist violence are juveniles. They go to schools. So we were working with 19 schools at that time. And the head teachers would be informed that this person goes to your school and this is what they've been doing, yeah? So that's, that kind of thing would happen. Rather than producing literature which sort of, uh, you know, was just racial attacks and all that, yeah? On the increase, you would say put antisocial behavior, yeah? So that way we'll, uh, you're looking uh, to working with, with the community. That everyone knows now that we are trying to make things better for whole of the community. Yeah. So as soon as those kind of literature de uh, uh, devised or we wrote them out, we didn't have any problem on the streets at all. We didn't. Anyone didn't say nothing. Everyone took interest in them, and we recruited people from the area. I think we, there was 43 people that we recruited from that area alone. So it was quite successful, you know, campaign. And it was just because we did not look 
uh, at, the, at the perpetrators properly before. We were thinking that they are just racist, that's all they're doing. But they were the same ones which were uh, taking drugs. They are the same ones who were doing alcohol. They are the same ones who were mugging uh, old people. Yeah, we actually monitored that, you know, when, when we were in that area. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, the present situation, right. And now, since two, uh, year 2000, as you know that, you know, we've had lots of immigration into the country, yeah? And it's normally the media, you know, saying uh, stampede at Heathrow. I don't know if you remember those times, you know, when uh, the Ugandan nations came in and the headlines would say stampede. Mm -hmm. And I know com coming from Kenya, you know what uh, stampede really means. Or Heathrow flooded, that kind of headline. So anything in the media does inside problems, yeah? And now look at this recent case of uh, Silpa Sati, where, you know, uh, being called a proper dumb everything. And we've ha already had three incidences in school where the kids have called Asian girls proper dumb, yeah? So it already started. So it is something which has to be looked at. I mean, what she done was completely racist, that jade woman, yeah? And what she has done is that it's out in our streets and all that. And we have to now pick up the pieces, yeah? Now, as you know, that the, the, we got, uh, 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 what you call them, policies and all that, yeah? Policies. Policy. Yeah. So you know that uh, the, the councils, uh, you know, got policy on racial violence and all that, and also got victim support package. And they, for them, uh, they reckon if they put a spy hole in your door, or if they put a couple of bolts on your door, yeah, and they've done your victim support, yeah? So what we believe, what we are actually doing this now, at this present stage, is that we actually are saying that we need to work with these perpetrators. Once they have ad been identified, that actually we work with them to try and change them. So the project that I worked with recently, that we actually worked with 104 young people who had caused problems in the area, and they were racist problems. Only four of them are reoffended. So there has been a proper success of that. So the, now we are looking at changing the behavior instead of slapping, uh, you know, sentencing or uh, trying to evict people is trying to work with them but always there is a threat we threaten them or we take your house away if we don't so that they come to the office that we actually talk to young people and try and change their ways for for the asian community in this borough yeah because i can only talk about this borough and there are certain parts where there are problems yeah there are quite uh, uh, few areas where unemployment is high so these are the kind of places where the british national party or the national party national front would actually recruit people there things are terrible because the asian community has been targeted yeah they've got this daily people breaking their windows calling them packies and everything putting shit through their door that kind of stuff yeah recently on the 23rd of november the last year we had a young nepalese guy who's just been come to this country the nepalese community is very new to this country and uh, they only come about uh, uh, in on november they were here for six weeks that's all so this guy called rakesh his girlfriend and three other young people were walking a friend to the railway station when they were confronted by five young people who abused them everything and then chased them and they nearly killed Rakesh. He's got his arm broken, his fingers are broken, he's got a big gash on his head. He's lucky his girlfriend found him in a pool of blood. He was actually in a dead end street where no one would have found him. And how quickly we got together the Nepalese community. Here we had a big pub public meeting. Yeah to advise the Nepalese community what kind of things we can do. How important is it is to get communities working together. How important is that people know what is going on, yeah? So by doing, by getting uh, the Asian, uh, we recruited about 36 volunteers. Only tomorrow we're gonna have a meeting where we are going to design the leaflet, which is going to go out in these estates to advise our new communities where are the hotspot areas, how to the, that they can work together, how to support each other, and wha who, what we can do. Early 90s, we were doing the same thing. Nothing has changed. I mean, when you were here in the 90s and all that, you know, uh, I remember you spent a lot of time uh, with, with us, actually seven days a week here. 
uh, nothing has changed really. We have still are out there, they are hot spots still. We are still campaigning, we are trying to get people together, working together, setting up support groups. Nothing has changed. Yeah, and there are particular areas you have to avoid. People have to, you know, and uh, you know, in this area, especially the new community has come in, have not a clue about the areas. They come in, they think, oh, brilliant, you know, they've come to UK, yeah, everything is okay, but then they suddenly get attacked. And they wonder, uh, you know, they heard all these good things about English people being so tolerant of everything, yeah, mm. but when they come into this country, they've been spat on, yeah, and uh, no respect. And these guys are quite. Uh, qualified the guys who have come from Nepal very clever people they are yeah they're not just uh, you know they just come in for you know they, these guys were very very highly qualified and they've been stabbed and been beaten up and I remember you know when when I left uh, uh, Greenwich uh, or, or uh, UK Greenwich was known as the racist capital of the of the Europe Absolutely. and has it changed or what has happened? Well, the, the thing is we haven't touched wood, we haven't had any murder. Uh, there has been two deaths in police custody, but you can't say that it's because Greenwich we've had deaths in police custody all over the country. But what has happened is that uh, the kind of work we have done now is that communities are working together. So touch wood, we haven't had any murders, yeah? Uh, we do object uh, to Ken Livingston of very long ago calling the Greenwich the capital of uh, you know, murders of UK. We object to that because we have moved on because the last murder was 93. And after that, we, we have done lots of work. They're, you know, being the, uh, the, the most experienced anti-racist worker in the whole country, I would say, uh, over the years, you have managed to come up with some solutions, uh, which you mentioned, like working in the community, identifying that uh, these perpetrators are are not just racist; they are basically antisocial people. So you come up with this uh, new strategy of of, of working uh, with the communities, and that in many ways is paying paying uh, paying off, in the sense that it is uh, uh, we haven't we didn't have any murders. In well, it, it is paying off because what we're trying to do is, unless you educate these young people out of what their behavior, you see, the young people, you can make them sign the anti-social behavior contract. Three weeks later, they've forgotten about them. Mm. What we need to do is, there are so many agencies here who work with young people. We need to work together so we get the schools to do something in the school with the kids. Yeah, We want the parents to come here and to talk to us Yeah, so we can do something with the children as well. There's probation services, there's yacht teams, there are all kinds of people out here. Yeah. So what's happened is everyone was doing a little bit here and there. No one was coordinating action. Now we have a panel which we meet up every eight weeks where we discuss difficult people, difficult cases. Yeah. And then we find a solution and we go and do, do it. And it has been very successful because I, I think there were about 600 young people identified in the last uh, three years as troublemakers. Out of those, we uh, selected 104, which we thought was the guys we need to work with. Mm -hmm. And up to now, only four had reoffended. And that was not on racial violence, by the way. Mm -hmm. These were racist guys, but the four offenses they have done is nothing to do with racial. So it has been very success successful. And the Home Office has. Uh, we have an award of that for that okay. and so now today you will you were here in the office you heard that I've been invited to come and speak in Westminster uh, to get this idea across to all the boroughs you know, so people can actually you know don't you know the thing is if you ask you know Satish if you ask anyone on the street any elderly person or any person what they think about young people they will come up with a saying they are antisocial, they got no respect, they got all that. This is what kind of things are said about them. And the young people know about that. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Unless we empower our young people, like when we were young, our parents used to say, oh, Shabash, and you are very well done, yeah? Mm -hmm. And encourage you to be something good, and then you become good, yeah? But if you have been constantly saying, you're bad, you're a hooligan, you're a hoodie, you're a this, you're a that, yeah? Mm -hmm. And the kids do that, you know? So what we need to do is empower our young people, and that's my role, is to empower young people, tell them that they have a future, yeah? Mm -hmm. And we want to see them, where are you going to be in 10 years? That's what I want to ask them, where they want to be in 10 years? Do they want a, a nice house, nice car, nice job, nice girlfriend, whatever, yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, then it uh, appears that uh I want to bring them to two issues now. It appears that uh, you know all the hard work we did, you did, us together in in the 80s. You now, 
uh, something good has come out of that in the sense that uh, you uh, have come up with a very good formula uh, which is working probably for the people in Greenwich and probably is, is repeated. You go uh, and give seminars and lectures and train various other people, so it's spreading throughout the UK. Uh, so, you know, what do you feel about that? I think uh, there is still a lot of work to be done. There are boroughs within London, yeah? They can easily go in the, on the internet and find out what other boroughs are doing, but they're not. So there is lots of work to be done. Yes, wherever people invite me, I go. You know, I've got uh, Hanslow to do, I've got a Westminster to do. I think I'm doing about 40, 48 uh, sessions of training this year just in Greenwich Borough, yeah? So there's lots of work to be done, and there's uh, th this message to be spread, yeah? So as uh, we are, uh, you know, being used as role model for some of the boroughs, we are trying to push it as far as possible. So I was in Liverpool not very long ago with uh, you know some colleagues of mine. So we've done some work there. We've done some work in Birmingham, yeah, in Manchester. So there are a number of places that we have done, but there is a lot more to be done. But I think the only way going to change things, and everyone knows that, is not bob wire fences, it's not double locks, it's not a bulletproof uh, vest, whatever. What it is, is about education, is about our young people, is about encouraging and empowering them, yeah? And people who have fallen uh, uh, off the track to bring them back on track, and there is plenty of people out there who can do that kind of work, but it needs to be coordinated, that's all.